but if you want to talk about something more, and, uh, well, I, I have also questions. To <laughs> and also, I, I, I think I uh, I wanted to also add a, a, one question more that will be something like, what do you think about uh, this kind of initiatives uh, to engage more women in technology? So I'm sending the last question to you. Also, this, all this question, I wanted to ask you about the, what do you think about <laughs> this initiative. So, Asin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, let's start. It's already recording. Um, say hi to the audience. Hello, audience. It's a pleasure to be here with all the rich Uh, my parents' generation, there was a martial law, there was a dictatorship and everything. Uh -huh. 
So we're the first uh, generation that enjoy the freedom of the press, mm -hmm. but we're also the same uh, generation that has access to personal computers. So people who are younger than me or about the same age, we grew up with personal computers, and our parents was uh, more of a uh, paper uh, yeah. age, right? So uh, the, this historical coincidence means that we're uh, the digital natives care a lot more about democracy mm -hmm. than the people who are uh, not digital natives because they were not uh, in a representative democratic uh, country at that time. So I think it's both a generation gap uh, in Taiwan among people who think they can you know, never influence the policy makers. Also that now that they're eventually moving because uh, things like Telegram, like Facebook, like Line, like WhatsApp mm -hmm. is really making the uh, elderly and even the, the like my grandparents, mm -hmm. so they're all on the internet now. Yeah. yeah, so they, they have uh, learned what the community is like, mm -hmm. but they never really in their mind to connect this kind of community mm -hmm. with the political agenda setting. Mm -hmm. uh, so even for things like their um, community council uh, for the you know local housing community housing neighborhood they still do it uh, in a very traditional representative uh, not even the council maybe just the commissioner would decide everything mm -hmm. and it's uh, the meeting is very formal and uh, the the transcription and everything it's not really open to the public mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very uh, traditional way of making decisions because that's how they are used to during the martial law Things, right? yeah. so, so I think for Taiwan, the main challenge uh, is to um, convince people that um, the uh, expert language that they rely uh, mm -hmm. on the pre-democracy days mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, everyday language that they use, everybody is now on Facebook and you know, uh, yeah. like all those online communities, uh, is to convince people that there can be a translation mechanism between the expert language and the everyday language. Mm -hmm. We need to work on ways so that the, my grandma or my grandpa, when there is a participatory budget in their neighborhood, mm -hmm. uh, it's translated to the language that they use. Mm -hmm. And it's like really every day. And mm -hmm. uh, it's made into a very pretty picture that I can send over WhatsApp or Telegram mm -hmm. and for them to forward over. But when they reply, they still actually influence the policy making. So, so they don't have to think that I have to learn this lawyer language in yeah. order to, to participate in politics. It could I be can, simple. Yeah, it could be simple, it could be uh, really a conversation that draws out their wisdom. Uh, and that's what we need, because we need their wisdom, their input into the political process. Yeah. So I think that that's the primary challenge. It's a generational one, but it's also the one between the experiment language and the, the everyday language. There, yeah. There's two other, I think, more minor challenges to be solved after we solve this inclusion mm -hmm. issue. Um, the second one is the facilitation, because in Taiwan we, we care a lot about consensus, about social consensus. Uh, but um, it's very hard to reach that if you only communicate on the internet. Even you are uh, like looking at the recording right now, you're seeing a two-dimensional snapshot of me. Yeah. I cannot see at the audience and see they're not comprehending what I'm talking about <laughs> or, or see their facial reactions yeah. or everything. So, which is why I always prefer to record in a uh, dialogue instead of monologue style. Yeah. Because then, uh, if I'm like talking nonsense, your uh, facial expression will let me know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I think this is facilitation. Uh, is both online, which is like knowing what people's general reactions are and responding in a way that is conductive to more consensus instead of more di diver uh, divergence. Mm -hmm. and, and it's something that we need to train. It's kind of emotional intelligence yeah. during face-to-face -face facilitation. Totally. But 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 this this can also be. Uh, done on Facebook. Yeah. You have to use a lot of emoji. Mm -hmm. you, have, you have to use a lot of <laughs> like active listening. There's a lot of technique to do that over online medium. But this yeah. is a new um, skill that needs to be trained and needs to be adopted. And finally, I think a accountability is also very important because once you have gathered all those signals from all the online, offline medium, people want to know how exactly their suggestions are binding. Mm -hmm. They are, and if they are not binding, why? Yeah. Uh, if the government says, okay, these are not feasible, is it because it's corrupt, or is it because it's against the law of physics? Okay. Right? It's, it's different, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we have a lot of citizen petitions yeah. that the construction is against the law of physics, yeah. and there's nothing we can do about that. <laughs> yeah. but, but 
it's very important to explain these two uh, and to, to tell people that there is this whole transcript of discussion that shows clearly why everybody thinks this way uh -huh. right, instead of just presenting a conclusion. Because the conclusion is have convinced nobody. But if you see the, the actual reason out uh, reaching into the conclusion, then I think people would be much more accepting saying, oh, it's actually... Uh, they based. tried a lot of things. Uh, yeah, but none of this works, so, so I'm sorry, but this is not uh, possible within this year. Mm -hmm. And I think people would be, be much more tolerant if they think so. Yeah. Yeah so, so, yeah, so basically just uh, translation of the long generation and expert language and facilitation and finally accountability and recording. Uh, these three are the challenges. No, Yeah, I think this is uh, much easier now than uh, when I joined the free software movement. I joined around 95 or so. It was before the term open source was invented. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then we require so free software activists, mm -hmm. but it actually constrained us to basically just code mm -hmm. software and some documentation, and that's it. Mm -hmm. right? But nowadays, I think people join uh, open source movement mostly first through text because Wikipedia is everybody's first entry mm -hmm. into the Creative Commons uh, mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And on Wikipedia, we see a lot of people not really, uh, you know, editing uh, in encyclopedia. They may be just fixing one typo. Mm -hmm. They may be just taking one picture and contribute that picture to the article. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they just care about their local school and they want <laughs> yeah. to make a documentary about their local school and upload it to Wikimedia Commons. Mm -hmm. So it's storytelling, it's um, taking pictures, it's basically everything that's not code. It's not code in the software sense anymore, mm -hmm. but there's a very important input. Uh, so I think, which is why I think the larger free culture movement and the larger what we call the open data mm -hmm. movement uh, now reaches more people than the original free software or open source community. We are still the backbone of the free, free culture movement and the open data movement, mm -hmm. but I think uh, we're not the main outreach anymore. Uh, once, once people uh, uh, enjoy the community, some of them will eventually want to change the rule of uh, how it's made. Mm -hmm. right? Nobody really uh, you know, spend their childhood saying, I want to be a lawyer to change the rule of my kindergarten. Right? <laughs> yeah. But the day after they, they lived in their uh, communities for a while, they will want to see some rule change. Mm -hmm. And then only then people get motivation to look into the source of their community's rules, mm -hmm. like the source of Wikipedia and the source of other online communities. And now that's a crucial point. If they look into the source, like Facebook, mm -hmm. and find that the source is not there, and, they, and then they, they see, oh, so this is a playground. I cannot change the rule of the playground. But if they look into the source of, say, uh, MediaWiki, mm -hmm. and then it's an open playground, mm -hmm. you can just contribute and add whatever you like as an extension to the Wikimedia server as long as, of course, you still have to write some Java code. <laughs> but, but, but then there's a motivation for you to do yeah. it. Yeah, and, and so I think that is really the turning point when people did get dissatisfied with some or want to contribute to the rule of the game of their existing free community. Mm -hmm. um, and they look into the source, whether it's open by default or whether it's closed by default. Mm -hmm. I think this is really the key to get more young people to try to change the rule of the game. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you evaluate new forms of political participation through mm -hmm. technology platforms and applications? Sure. Um, well, there's two uh, answers here. One is me personally, uh -huh. and one is me as the digital minister. Of course, oh, it's a okay. different answer. <laughs> yeah. uh, for me personally, I evaluate it mainly by how, uh, how much fun uh, everybody is having uh -huh. uh, around the project. Uh -huh. Because for me personally, a project, a platform, is just a, a excuse for people to meet and learn from each other. So, yeah. so it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to even work. Yeah. You know, to, to enjoy a, a prototype failure together. It's still uh -huh. a fun experience. Uh -huh. So there's no uh, pressure of, of success or anything. But if people are not having fun, if people are being toxic, if people are stereotyping yeah. each other, if people are excluding yeah. others and so on, then right and competitive. And no matter you know how 
that their quality of their code is, the community mm -hmm. will fracture, mm -hmm. right? The community will not link together. And by the end, you will have less of a community compared to when you started. Yeah. Right? So for me personally, I think fun is really, the enjoyment of community is really the only evaluation criteria that I see in any projects. Mm -hmm. Of course, as the digital minister, I can say that. <laughs> I'm not the, the minister of fun, right? <laughs> to have a minister of fun. Uh, but I'm the, also a digital minister and as the minister in charge of, of open government, um, I think uh, there are uh, four main criteria that I use to evaluate the technologies that we're procuring or we're sponsoring. Um, the first three is the traditional values of open government, uh, that is to say transparency, mm -hmm. participation, mm -hmm. and accountability. Mm -hmm. and, and these are, uh, I think, to me more than um, criteria. For me, they are rights mm -hmm. of citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, every citizen has a right to see transparently mm -hmm. how their government works. Mm -hmm. So we can judge a new form of political participation by how transparent it actually makes. Mm -hmm. Is it only transparent to lawyers? Mm -hmm. Is it only transparent to people uh, who can spend five hours a day on this? Mm -hmm. Is it only transparent, you know, these things? So if it's truly transparent, it means that people who are experts can take this into make something that's more understandable mm -hmm. by people who are less of an expert than them. Mm -hmm. And then these people can then, or, then take this and then make something that's more easily accessible. Mm -hmm. And for me, that is true transparency. But if you just publish 500 page of PDF uh, on the website yeah. and then say uh, this is under a non-derivative license, copyright, all, mm -hmm. all really copyright reserved, mm -hmm. then nobody can take this 500 page PDF and make a web comic. Yeah. Out of it. And then this for me is not transparency, no yeah. matter how well prepared those 500 pages are. Yeah. Uh, so that's the first criteria. And the second criteria, uh, participation uh, through uh, technology, I think uh, it needs a way for people who use all different devices. Mm -hmm. uh, like if I make a technology that people can only participate through Microsoft Windows XP, then yeah. there's not really participation, right? Yeah. Uh, you have to first install this ActiveX control and so on. So basically, uh, participation has to be direct. It, it has to be a way for the citizen to directly go through the process making mm -hmm. um, instead of uh, outsourcing it to a third party technology mm -hmm. uh, proprietary vendor mm -hmm. and say, you know, we will just outsource the participation mm -hmm. to, to this technology vendor. Mm -hmm. No matter how benign, how good hearted, is it's still uh, the power still flows to the center mm -hmm. and participation for me has to flow to the edge mm -hmm. to the leaves yeah. so that's the second criteria and uh, in addition of course to transparency and participation there's also accountability so as a minister of digital for example i have to work with the ministry of transport mm -hmm. and the ministry of finance and the ministries of other ministries mm -hmm. and say okay here is a uh, open government platform and people are petitioning or Dialogue, mm -hmm. but still you have to make final decisions and be politically accountable for it. Yeah. I cannot, I as the process designer, cannot behave as if I'm the Minister of Transport. Yeah. I cannot behave as if I'm the Minister of Finance, it's yeah. not possible. Yeah. But I can be a channel between the ministers and people uh -huh. uh, who are doing petitions or participatory processes. But at the end, they still have to come out and say, even though this is collaboratively decided by everybody, mm -hmm. I still take responsibility for it mm -hmm. and I think this is very important it's not an excuse to say okay be just because the people have a participatory process I don't have to take political responsibility mm -hmm. this doesn't work because then the next time people will be less willing to contribute yeah. because they, they will feel that they are being used as excuses to make bad policy yeah right maybe the problem is not in the idea maybe it's in the execution right so the accountability during execution is still very important how many um, taxpayer money is paid and how many progress is being made every month and every week. This is also important. And finally, I would like to say uh, the inclusion is behind all these three uh, mm -hmm. criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to more and more make all these tools accessible, not only for people using computers, but people using their phones. Mm -hmm. Not only smartphones, but just normal, regular feature phones yeah. and so on. And if we don't uh, lower the threshold of transparency, participation, and uh, accountability can we create a new elite mm -hmm. um, uh, of young people mostly mm -hmm. uh, and, and that will actually widen the distrust between generations instead of bridging the society. Yeah, good.
And well, in Brazil, government got the data later not discuss, like they didn't discuss with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's new management, management like uh, either uh, municipal, state, or federal. They is a change in the policy, and uh, they not available to to communicate between each other. So it it makes more difficult to sit and access uh, the democracy and the policies. Uh, do you think it's possible to change this? Like we have a mm, you know, like a different kind of power, like in this power, state and federal, mm -hmm. and they communi didn't communicate with each other. They always have a confusion. But what do you think about this, this kind of? Yes, uh, when we talk about open data. What we mean is actually two different things. And open data has both open format, which means that it has to be able to be processed by free software. Mm -hmm. And also open license, mm -hmm. meaning that it has to allow people to reuse it in mm -hmm. some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but these two are actually two very different things. Mm -hmm. And to uh, many government institutions, mm -hmm. it's actually a pro and a con. Because a, uh, a common format, it's something that is very good for governance uh -huh. because they can exchange much more easily data formats between the municipal systems and the national systems. Uh -huh. By an open license for them, represent risk. Oh, yeah. Because, because uh, if you allow people to compete with government using some kind of data, sometimes the government will think that, okay, so maybe I'm no longer the only service provider. Mm -hmm. uh, of public service, maybe yeah. somebody in the private sector will take all our data and provide service that uh, binds people to proprietary solutions or something. There are many uh, government officials who may think that way, right? Mm -hmm. So choosing a license that works with the local culture is very important, yeah. but then it also creates a uh, tension between people who want different sorts of licenses. Mm -hmm. Because this is the same you see in the free software community. Mm -hmm. Some people think the MIT permissive license is best, some people think copyleft is better, some people think ephoros copyleft, meaning that even the people who access your website through the browser must have the source, is okay. even better. And then these people are very different camps, we've been having this discussion for 30 years now uh, about different kinds of licensing. So instead of getting into a, a debate about license, mm -hmm. I would suggest uh, that any government to evaluate first the open format that they can agree to, yeah. uh, whether it's linked data, or whether it's JSON LP, or whether it's uh, RDF, or semantic web, or OData, or uh, Open API, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, anything that uh, they can agree to, to facilitate this uh, mm -hmm. internal exchange, mm -hmm. there's a much more uh, likelihood mm -hmm. for it to be adopted on a national level as a national standard, mm -hmm. right? This is like uh, people would generally agree we use uh, kilograms, and, mm -hmm. you know, or, or uh, miles and, or meters, right? This is very important because if you use miles and I use meters, we cannot talk about the same thing. Uh, yeah, once they all agree on the format, mm -hmm. then we can talk about license. So my concrete suggestion is that for open data, we solve the technical problem first. Uh -huh. And once we have a pipeline, it's like a neural system mm -hmm. of the entire data format exchange, mm -hmm. and then we talk about license and the privacy and all the more uh, human issues uh, on this data. Mm -hmm. Let's start with the technical, we'll make it easy. Good. And uh, the last question is about how, to, how, what do you think about this kind of initiative like Mariela mm -hmm. to engage more women mm -hmm. and also transgender people mm -hmm. to the technology? Mm -hmm. that, um, what do you think about? Well, I, I think it's it's part of the, the inclusion because what my idea of inclusion is not just you know, the majority giving room to a minority. This yeah. is a very old view of inclusion. Yeah. Uh, the, the modern view is what we call intersectionality, meaning that uh, for many of us, we are uh, in some uh, traits of mm -hmm. our person, we are in the majority. Mm -hmm. But for some other traits, we may be in the minority. Yeah, yeah so uh, we may be people who repress other people if we are not careful yeah. in some way. Yeah. But while being repressed by other people in some other different way, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe um, not just race, gender, mm -hmm. age, but also more subtle other repressions. So I think the idea of these empowerment uh, spaces is very important because this is basically saying for uh, 
this kind of repression, we say no to it, but we say it out of a principle of no any kind of repression. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're a feminist who are very well versed in, in defending the right of being oppressed, uh, then you can also work to defend the disabled people, the, you know, the uh, physically or mentally handicapped people, yeah. the, the people who are of aborigines or of a minority language, yeah. and things like that, because it's the same skill. Yeah. It's the same skill. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think this is very important because no matter where you learn the skill, as a, as a woman or as a uh, handicapped people or as a uh, people who live with a special kind of neighborhood or as a uh, people who are oppressed in some other way, uh, at the end all these skills add together. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. a, a uh, organizer in a feminist hackerspace uh, was the organizer for the labor movement. They actually have a lot of the same language yeah. and this builds more solidarity mm -hmm. because otherwise we see also some divisions between the left camps mm -hmm. who focus on different uh, parts of the social mm -hmm. right program. But I think on this kind of space, these activists can join together and agree saying, you know, no matter what your uh, minority status is, was preserving together as a space of uh, solidarity, I mm -hmm. think. But this only happens in a physical space, mm -hmm. because then people can see each other eye to eye and feel the real uh -huh. empathy, and instead of running their own newsletters, and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so a physical space, I think, really is the, the most important part of it. So I yeah. really look forward to seeing more of these efforts. Oh, yeah. yeah. I will show some something that we did last year. Uh -huh. Yeah, OK, <laughs> sure. And, uh,
Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm here all week, so we can produce more of these. Yeah. And as the week goes by. I like the end. Really nice. Cheers. Cheers.